So I'm about to show you a video clip of something I just filmed that really, 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 really scares and bothers me. Because as someone who counsels people in making their lives happier and healthier, I don't do that from the perspective of what I think a happy, healthy life is. I ask my clients, what do you think the ultimate happy and healthy life would be for you? And then help them achieve that. I don't project any of my own opinions of what healthy and happy is onto my clients. I let them talk to me and tell me what would be happy and healthy for them because there is such a multitude of different religions and therefore, you know, nuances of morals and ethics that at the end of the day, if someone is trying to achieve something that is ultimately good, that is inherent and something that I help people do. So when we start taking away people's ability to achieve perspective, multiple perspectives, because that's how we learn and grow the most. I wouldn't be as happy and as healthy as I am if I didn't dip my toe into all of the pools of perspective that I do. Whether it's studying all of the different religions which, you know, I haven't studied all of them. I'm not saying that. But anytime I have a new client who has a religion that I don't know much about, the first thing I do is study it if it means a lot to them or even if it doesn't. Studying the different political perspectives. I've studied many of them and am continuing to study them because as someone who helps people from all walks of life, I have to be able to wrap my head around each of them to be help, to be able to help them achieve what they want as a happy, healthy life. So to take away anybody's ability to exercise their right to gaining perspective scares the crap out of me because it is those multiple perspectives that come together that is what makes the world beautiful. It's what made America the place of opportunity is because people from all walks of life could come together and work together and they still can. But when you take the ability for any one particular one of those away from anyone that's a slippery slope that doesn't end well for anybody and there are things that are inherently good and inherently bad at the end of the day they're extremes otherwise in the nuances of things it's all just energy floating around but just because it hurts your feelings doesn't mean it's wrong and that's why i posted that last post I did, there is a difference between speaking your truth and saying what you think is the truth. Because what your truth is and what the truth is are two different things. Or can be, at the very least, two different things. And we are a amazingly amazingly nuanced world of beautiful beings that don't deserve this. So I'm going to show you this clip and then I'll finish what I have to say. Social media service Parler, which we told you about, is seeing massive and unprecedented And yet I just couldn't traffic. get in. Yeah, so I've even experienced server outage because of new users tonight. Why? A couple of reasons. Mostly this. Parler is a free speech alternative to Twitter. They don't censor you, you can say what you want. The president is on parlor, and that has drawn a lot of people who realize they are being suppressed by Twitter. Parlor's succeeding. 
What happens now? Of course, Silicon Valley is trying to kill it. Google has just removed Parler without any warning from its app store. Apple and Amazon, which provide services that keep Parler, keep services like Parler online, have also threatened to shut Parler down. Amy Peacock, Peacock is the chief policy advisor at Parler, and she joins us. Amy, thanks this so much so scary. for coming on. This seemed to come out of nowhere. How big a threat to your company is this? I mean, this is very huge because Apple in particular carries our app on the App Store, and as far as I know, technically there's no other way to deliver it. So if they choose to withdraw their services and hosting us on their store, we're toast there. And, and you know, most people like our app. Our, our app is a, a very nicely functioning uh, piece of software. Parlor. And then in terms of Amazon, Amazon is also uh, raising some problems, and I'm not sure how serious that is yet because I've yet to speak with them. I will later today. And, it, they, you know, they provide server for us. And if they were to remove their services, then we'd be down. As it is, we're having, you know, some difficulties now with the uptick in uh, traffic. But if they took their service away, we'd be gone. I mean, there is a huge amount. It's impossible to overstate the amount of filth and political extremism, explicit violence, pornography, whatever, on the Internet. That's what the Internet is. But yes. it's parlor. It's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. everywhere. But yes. it's parlor that is being singled out. I mean, it's kind of impossible not to conclude this is political repression. It really, because I think we do have the reputation as being the conservative platform, although we are nonpartisan, that is what everybody sees us as. We do see this as being politically singled out. The other thing is that we are competing with other platforms Parler who have decided that like they the want to have. surveil the people on their platform 24-7 without any particularized suspicion. And, you know, on the one hand, people don't like to live in the world of Orwell's 1984. And then on the other hand, a lot of people seem to want to pressure social media to do more to moderate, as they call it, content on their platforms. But that would require 24-hour surveillance. And we don't think that that is consistent with the principles of America. So just to be clear for our viewers who aren't familiar with your company and your app, sure. You're just trying to provide a place for people to say what they think. You're not trying to put Amazon out of business or dethrone no. Apple or force anybody else's carrier to drop their service. You just want to be left alone and do your thing. Am I mischaracterizing that? Yes. I mean, we would just like to provide a place where people can come and they can speak freely, that they're not going to be fact-checked, they're not going to be told what to think, what they can read, etc. And also, we do not data pillage. We don't data mine them. We don't turn them into commodities and try to monetize them. And so we would just like to provide that service. And of course, like everybody else, we were horrified by a lot of the incitement that was going on this week. And we are doing everything that we can within our principles to, you know, deal appropriately with that content. And we, you know, we work with law enforcement as well. Uh, but that content has been everywhere this week. This has been a very unusual week. And to be singled out, we think, is quite unfair. Well, I mean, it's just, it's political oppression, period. Now, Definitely. Google, we asked why they did this, and they sent a relatively long statement. We're just going to read a snippet of it to you on the air. We're aware of continued posting in the Parler app that seeks to incite ongoing violence in the U.S. It continues. In light of this ongoing and urgent public safety threat, we're suspending the app's listing <laughs> from the Play Store until it addresses these issues. Okay, so they're accusing you of inciting violence. They are putting on us the responsibility for every piece of incitement that is posted there. Mm. And the nature of an open platform, a free and open town square, is that we do not take action on people until we are aware of a situation. Right. It's you, you, particularized suspicion. You do so let me just ask you really quick, I mean, how much of the world's kitty porn goes through Gmail? How many Gmail accounts have been used to order plastic explosives? How many insurrections have been planned on Google? Like right. a lot. And so, sure. right? I mean, this is a completely arbitrary standard applied to you because they don't like the politics of the people who use your site. I, I mean, that it's looking that way. I'm hoping it's not that way, but it's looking that way. And, it, and it's coming in sooner than I would have expected it. Yeah. Well, it's all happening at once. This Friday night happening all this Friday night. We're going to look back on this night. Amy Peacock, appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you, Tucker.
So as we said, Twitter has permanently suspended the president from its app. The question is, how far will this go, and what will its effects be? Craig Dillon is a former advisor to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. He ran Johnson's social media accounts. He joins us tonight. Craig, where do you think this is headed from here? Well, I think they've set themselves a dangerous precedent. The question is, you know, who do they ban next? Are the Chinese accounts coming down? Do you know, the supreme no. leader of Iran regularly tweets. Uh, you've got the Venezuelan leader. He's using Twitter all the time. So where does this stop? Do they, are they going to ban all of these people, or is it just particular ones that they don't like? So in, in this country, and I'm sure it's similar in the UK, these platforms are our public square. This is how people sort out their political differences, how they learn about politics, and many other things. So when you shut these down, you are isolating people. It seems to me you are ensuring the rise of real extremism in this country. I mean, it's obvious. Censorship makes people paranoid and crazy and frustrated and angry and sometimes violent. They must know that. Why are they doing this? Well, they're, they're seeing unbelievable amounts of pressure from, from various people in, in uh, their side of society to, uh, to uh, ban him and, and do all of these sorts of things. It's, it's an interesting decision for them to make. I imagine they took a lot of debating over it. But as you say, this yeah. is going to push people onto, as we've already heard, places like Parler and things like that. Um, so it, it's basically just segregated the people now. You know, the only people that are going to be using Twitter are going to tend to be left-leaning people, whereas right-leaning people are going to go onto Parler and places like that. It's just made uh, both sides are going to be an echo chamber. Uh, but and it, it's not good for democracy. No, and it's an attack on people, and they feel under siege. This is, we're, we're turning up the temperature too high. These companies are doing that, I think. Craig, it's great to see you. Thank you. This, this really, this really scares me for our future. Really scares me. And this is why being educated in the past and the consequences of the past is so important and understanding when something has been tried enough times to know what the outcome is going to be no matter you know there there are people out there who are you know amazing people who think that they can change the world who just don't realize that we've seen the outcomes of what they're talking about and they're never they're never inherently good even though they come from a well-meaning good place so watch this clip and i'll see you on the other side yeah i i stopped posting on twitter last night i'm not closing my account there, but i won't be posting there anymore um ironically this all happens today Sean, these big tech, uh, the big tech, big government symbiote, because that's what it is, um, is now in an open war with free speech and civil liberties in America. Uh, listen, I'm not making a First Amendment argument for you here. These are private companies. I'm making an even more dangerous argument that these tech companies are more powerful than the government and will have a more pernicious effect on civil liberties by engaging in open war with free speech like they're doing right now. I can back that up right now. At least with government, you have a process. If you're arrested by the government or fined by the government, there's a process. That's, you know, the law and order. That's the order component. You can get a lawyer and you can fight back. That's not what you have. We have been threatened by Apple with 24 hours notice with nearly no legitimate recourse whatsoever, Parler, that were gonna be taken down from their site by a monopoly company that monopolistically controls its app store. Even worse, Twitter bans the President of the United States while China's still posting about uh, sterilizing Uyghurs and the Iranians are running their death to America account? And to the liberals laughing about this, one more point I wanna make on this, because there are many. Go to any social media platform and you'll see it. To the liberals who think this is funny, Remember, famous last words in unprincipled revolutions, not bedrocked in real principles, and there are no principles here other than political ones, they're coming for you next. Famous last words in the French Revolution were, no, no, I was on your side. There is no side. This is a political attack. This isn't a principled one, and they're coming for you next. This fight's coming to your door, folks. Get ready. You can't avoid it. Uh, well, no, not letting the American people make up their own minds. So here's why this scares me. When we censor people, we 
prevent people from exercising their rights. And especially here in America, that was what made America so amazing and full of opportunity was that no matter who you are, where you came from, what your beliefs were, you could exercise your inalienable rights. Freedom of speech is one of them. Freedom of speech is an inalienable right because if I go out, whether it's in my bathroom or out onto the street, just on a street corner without my phone, I can talk with my mouth. And as long as nobody touches me, you can't stop me. That's an inalienable right, something you can't take away from somebody. You can't take my right to speak away unless you were to physically attack me. And we all know that that's not, <laughs> that's not okay. So unless you assume some sort of physical violence upon somebody, you cannot take, you know, cutting out their uh, voice, you know, cutting out someone's vocal cords, you know, you cannot take away their freedom of speech. And even then they could write it. Although that would require a piece of paper um, or some sort of tool, but still, you get my point. You know, without enacting some sort of horrible violence on someone, you cannot take away their rights. That's what makes them rights. Like freedom of speech. I can go out on a street corner and say whatever I want. So places like YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Parler, those are all places where they are considered public forums, which means that anyone can show up and exercise their rights. So this is important because they are protected as a public forum rather than the other option, which would be a publisher under certain laws. So if you're a publisher and, and picking and choosing what content is on your site, you are not protected by these laws. Whereas if you are a public forum, you are protected by section 230 is, is the law. A public forum, people can exercise their rights, which means the company that's acting as a public forum, the app that's acting as a public forum, is not held responsible for anything that is said or done because of someone exercising their rights. Now, if you're a publisher and you start censoring people, you limit who can and cannot have accounts, you limit, you know, limit what they can and cannot say, you become a publisher and therefore do not have those same rights. This is important because you can't have it both ways. You either are a public forum or you are a publisher. You can't be both. You can either be protected by this law or you're not, depending on what you consider yourself. And if you're a public forum, you are basically obligated because you are considering yourself a public forum to let people exercise their rights. Now, here's what's so dangerous about not letting people exercise their rights. When we start trying to impose laws and implement things like this that affect people's ability to exercise their rights, A, it's a slippery slope. Because if you do it to one, you set a precedent to do it to anybody. And that's how, that's how things work. It is it's not acceptable until it is. And once it is, then it usually takes some sort of great, great conflict to make it unokay again. That's what setting precedence is. But here's the thing. It may hurt your feelings. That doesn't make it wrong. That's why I posted what I did earlier about there's a difference between your truth and the truth. There's a difference between expressing your truth and saying that what you have to say is the truth. And so at the end of the day, like you don't have to follow them. You don't have to download the app if you don't like it. But what makes us ama amazing, what makes this place so great, especially America, 
is that because we have all of these perspectives, we have, it opens our mind to the possibilities, which makes us healthier and happier, ultimately as human beings. The moment you start making it so that people have a harder and harder time to exercise their rights, the less happy and the less healthy people are going to be. Not just on the side that's being restricted, but even on the side that's not being restricted. And trust me, eventually it's all going to be restrictive. Because once you set a precedent, that's it. So... The fact that we're getting to the point where people are getting so sensitive that because something hurts their feelings, all of a sudden we're supposed to be restricting people's rights. And let me, let me make this point for you. This is probably the last thing I'm going to say. I can say something that isn't racially motivated and someone else could take it as racially motivated. And let me give you an example. I could say this guy, his wife said that he beats her. We should probably look into that. And those words aren't inherently racist at all. This guy's wife said he beat her. We should look into that. There's no racial context in those words at all. And yet, if I was to say that about a black man, someone could accuse me of being racist when it's not about the color of his skin, but the character of the person. That's what I'm commenting on. I don't give a flying freaking frack about what color the person's skin is. I care about the content of their character. But someone could call me racist and see what I said as racist, even though I didn't, didn't care what color the person's skin was. I cared about what they did. This actually happens to me a lot because I'm white. <laughs> more and more and more and more and more. But here's the thing is your truth isn't necessarily the truth. Your perspective is not necessarily the truth. And people's perspectives can be so wrong because they're colored by their own perception of the past. They're colored by their own perceptions of what they see to be true in the moment. And so I can say something that isn't racially motivated and because that's all that's on somebody's mind right now, they can accuse me of being racist. They can accuse me of hurting their feelings. But I have a right to be concerned about whether or not this guy is beating on his wife, no matter what color his skin is. I think we can all agree on that. So this is why we have to be so careful because just because one person thinks something doesn't make it true. Just because someone is unwilling to think about all the other possibilities doesn't make those possibilities any less possible. So when we censor people, based on one thing or another because it hurts someone's feelings. When that's just their perspective, I could say something that, like what I was just talking about, someone could totally agree with me, someone could eh, kind of agree with me, and that could really piss somebody off. I've had all those happen under one single comment, this particular comment. I've seen it for my own, for my own self, with my own eyes. So this is why it's so dangerous to censor people just because some people's feelings are hurt. Doesn't mean it was the intention for anyone's feelings to be hurt and doesn't mean it hurt 
everybody else's feelings. And when we project that possibility of injury on everyone, we limit ourselves from some amazing things just because one person is sensitive to it. Imagine, imagine if strawberries were banned across the world. Imagine if peanuts, you could never eat peanuts again, never eat strawberries. Imagine if we banned those things from the entire world because a handful of people have a peanut allergy or an aller allergy to strawberries. That's exactly what's happening here. And that's what we have to be aware of. Just because one person's sensitive to, to it doesn't mean everyone is, doesn't mean that it's not a valid perspective. And we really need to be thinking about this right now because it's important and it's actually affecting people. The fact that people fighting against oppression are doing it with oppression needs to be thought about right now. Thank you for listening. May the energies you serve serve you well.